should start. Ready? Okay. Good evening and welcome to our final lecture on covenant theology. Tonight's topic is covenant theology and the sacraments. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for giving us this time to come together on a Friday night and to reflect deeply upon your word and all that your word has to teach us about uh, your covenants, especially the covenant of grace and the signs and seals of that covenant. We ask that you would bless us tonight and encourage us and point us to Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So tonight we're going to be looking at two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Uh, with baptism, we're going to be looking at the covenantal argument for paedo-baptism, and then for the Lord's Supper, we'll be looking at the argument against paedo-communion. And before we do that, though, <coughs> let us first just give some introductory remarks about the sacraments in general. Heidelberg Catechism, question 65, asks, it is by faith alone that we share in Christ and all his benefits. Where then does that faith come from? Answer, the Holy Spirit works it in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel and confirms it by the use of the Holy Sacraments. So notice that <coughs> the answer is not that the Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts by the sacraments, but that the Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel, and then confirms it by the use of the Holy Sacraments. The next question then is, what are the sacraments? Question 66. They are holy, visible signs and seals appointed of God for this end, that by the use thereof, he may the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. So notice that in this uh, next question on, on the uh, answer to what are the sacraments, it, it goes back again to the gospel, right? The first question, question 65, the Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel. Then in question 66, what are the sacraments? The sacraments are holy, visible signs and seals appointed of God for this end, that by the use thereof, he may the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel, which is simply unpacking that phrase from the previous question, that the Spirit confirms faith by the use of the holy sacraments. So covenant theology is clearly in the background here. The catechism doesn't mention the word covenant here in this, but you can see that the concept is there, right? The covenant theology helps us to understand what sacraments are. They are uh, signs and seals of the covenant of grace. That's what they are. Actually, the Westminster Confession does use that language in uh, chapter 27, the very first sentence, 27.1. The sacraments are signs and seals of the covenant of grace. They are given to us <coughs> as visible signs and seals to more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel, as the catechism says. Remember, we talked about what is the essence of the covenant of grace? The essence of the covenant of grace is that it is a promise. And so that's why when we talked about uh, the syllogism of faith last week, that we get assurance by the syllogism of faith, we are using the covenant of grace as a promise and we're relying upon that promise to gain assurance of our acceptance before God. So covenant theology is very helpful for understanding what the sacraments are and how they work. They're signs and seals of the promise of the gospel, aka they are signs and seals of the covenant of grace because the covenant of grace is the promise of the gospel. We see this from uh, baptism uh, in the New Covenant, where baptism is given to us as the outward sign and seal of the promise of the covenant. But we also see this with circumcision in the Old Testament. This language of the sign of the covenant is directly taken from circumcision. In Genesis 17, verse 11, God said to Abraham, you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Paul looks back upon that verse in Romans 4, verse 11, and he says that Abraham received the sign of circumcision, 
as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Now, we're not talking about baptism and circumcision just yet. I'm simply using this language from Genesis 17 and Romans 4 to show us that this concept of the sacraments being signs and seals of the covenant is biblical language. From directly from Genesis 17, the sign of the covenant, and from Romans 4, 11, the sign and seal. Calvin defines a sacrament as an outward sign by which the Lord seals on our consciences the promises of his goodwill toward us in order to sustain the weakness of our faith. Isn't that a great definition? An outward sign by which the Lord seals on our consciences the promises of his good will toward us. That is the promises of the gospel. And he does it in order to sustain the weakness of our faith. The promise always precedes the sign. The promise always precedes the sacraments. The sacrament is always an appendix to the promise. It simply is there to seal, to ratify, to confirm the promise and to make it more certain to us. God is setting before our eyes, before our senses, this reality of his promise, of his good will toward us in Christ. This sealing function of the covenant signs, that is providing us with this confirmation, this ratification, this uh, assurance of the promise, this sealing function of the covenant signs is something that does not occur automatically just by the act of the sacrament being performed. It happens by the secret working of the Spirit using the sacrament for that purpose. This fits with the nature of the covenant of grace as having two concentric circles. Now you know why I drew this up here. Because the covenant of grace has two concentric circles. There's the outer circle, which is the members of the visible covenant administration, and then there is the elect within that. Not everyone who is a member of the visible administration of the covenant is truly elect, is part of the people of God in the internal sense. We talked about this uh, a while ago and when we distinguished between the covenant as a legal relationship versus as a communion of life. As a legal relationship, all who are circumcised, all who are baptized are included within this covenant community. But as a communion of life, only the elect, those to whom the Spirit has taken that outward sign and made it effective to their hearts, only those are in the inner circle as the covenant as a communion of life. The sacraments are simply instruments through which the Spirit actually applies to the elect the things that the sacraments signify. Being washed with the water in baptism signifies the washing of away of your sins in the blood of Christ. Does that mean that everybody who's been baptized with water has their sins washed away by the blood of Christ? Not necessarily. There is no automatic magical power in the sacraments themselves. It is that they are instruments by, the, by which the Spirit applies to the elect the things that the sacraments signify. There's an interesting uh, passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 uh, where Paul <coughs> makes this very point to the Corinthian Christians. He's talking to a visible covenant community of, of believers at Corinth, not all of whom are elect, not all of whom are truly born again. And he says to them, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers, referring to the Old Testament believers, our fathers like the people of Israel in the Old Testament times, our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. By the way, that preposition into should probably be translated as in the name of or in relation to. Uh, we see that same thing in Romans 6, being baptized into Christ. So all who are baptized in the name of Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink. Notice how Paul is looking back on the Old Testament believers, and he's describing their sacraments in ways that intentionally remind you of Christian sacraments, right? Baptized into Moses in the, in the sea, uh, eating the same spiritual food and the same spiritual drink. Uh, 
referring to the manna and the, the water that came from the rock. But he's using that language to remind you of what we Christians eat of, which is the Lord's Supper, right? He says, they, all, they were all baptized, <clears throat> they all ate the same spiritual food and, and drank the same spiritual drink. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us. So clearly Paul is saying that the sacraments do not automatically save you. And you can see this just by looking at the sacraments of the Old Testament. The Westminster Confession, chapter 28, verse 6, talking about the efficacy of one of the sacraments, namely baptism, puts it this way. The efficacy, by the way, I, I sometimes wonder about that word efficacy. Does everybody know what that word efficacy means? It's not too hard, right? It just means the effectiveness. But sometimes I wonder because I've heard people say, what is efficacy? So the effectiveness of baptism is not tied to that moment of time wherein it is administered. Yet, notwithstanding, by the right use of this ordinance, the grace promised is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred by the Holy Ghost to such as that grace belongeth unto, according to the counsel of God's own will in his appointed time. The inner circle, the elect, right? So the Westminster Confession is clearly saying here that the efficacy of baptism is not tied to the moment of time where it's administered. It's not tied to the ordinance itself. Nevertheless, the Holy Spirit makes this sign effective uh, in his own time and only to those to whom it belongs, that is, to the elect. It's important to point this out because there are some who love to emphasize the objectivity of baptism and the Lord's Supper. For example, Lutherans often will say, don't seek assurance by looking within, even, even at your own faith. Rather, just look to your baptism. They're almost saying that you can have assurance just by the mere fact that you've been baptized. If I've been baptized, therefore I'm saved. And that's what they teach. Uh, the Federal Vision uh, some of the members of the Federal Vision, like Peter Lightheart, also say the same thing, that baptism actually saves you, and they speak of this idea of the objectivity of the covenant, that everyone who is baptized should view themselves as saved. Of course, the problem is, for both Lutheran theology and for the Federal Vision, they do recognize that not everyone who is baptized is going to go to heaven, because some people fall away, some people are apostate. And so that leads them logically, because of their commitment to the efficacy of baptism, because they hold to baptismal regeneration. Actually, I should be careful there. Lutherans hold to baptismal regeneration. Among the federal visionists, there's a spectrum. Some like Peter Lightheart actually do teach that. Others have kind of uh, distanced themselves a little bit from Peter Lightheart and don't quite go that far. But Lutherans and these, this strong version of the federal vision like Peter Lightheart, they do take the next step and they logically reject the fifth point of Calvinism. Right, the fifth point of Calvinism, the P, tulip, the perseverance of the saints, that all who are elect, all who have been savingly united to Christ by genuine saving faith uh, will persevere to the end and not one of the elect will lose their state of grace. It's not, not possible for you to enter into a state of grace to be forgiven, justified, born again, have the Holy Spirit, and then later on to fall away from that. We then would say that those who do fall away from a profession of faith demonstrate that they were never truly saved to begin with. But Lutherans and Federal Vision hardcore ones, like Lightheart, they deny the fifth point of Calvinism. They reject that. They think that it is possible to fall from the state of grace. And that's all an implication and a logical deduction from the fact that they began with this assumption that we can look to baptism as our assurance, that baptism itself is what regenerates you. And so clearly we have to distance ourselves from that. It's interesting, ironically, that the people who hold to the federal vision claim to be reformed, <laughs> but they are obviously not in keeping with the fifth point of Calvinism. And I would argue even some of the other points too logically begin to fall down. If you reject the fifth point, you also have to reject you know, the third point, limited atonement, and you have to reject 
uh, unconditional election to. You have to basically say that you can lose your election. <laughs> so, uh, and some of them did say that, not others, not all of them. I don't think Doug Wilson went that far, but there are some that do. Now, it is true, though, we do want to be careful here. Although we're distancing ourselves from this Lutheran simplistic statement, don't seek assurance by looking within, just look to your baptism. I want to distance myself from that. But at the same time, I do think we could say this. Look to the promise of the gospel as signified and sealed to you in baptism. So it's not wrong to look to your baptism as long as you don't just do a simplistic deduction. You know, we could use the syllogism of baptism. Remember last week we had the syllogism of faith. You could create a syllogism of baptism for the Lutheran view and some of the strong federal vision view. Uh, I've been, all who are baptized are saved. I've been baptized, therefore I'm saved. Okay, that I don't agree with. That's, that's the wrong syllogism. But we could take the syllogism of faith, which we talked about last week, and include baptism within that, which is all who believe are baptized, or all who believe are, sorry, let me correct that, all who believe are saved, baptism is a sign and seal of that promise. Therefore, I can say, because I believe in the promise of the gospel, which is signified and sealed to me in my baptism, I can have assurance that I am saved. But it's mediated through the promise. That this goes back all the way to what we were saying at the very beginning about how, notice how the promise is the key. Heidelberg Catechism 66. The sacraments are holy, visible signs and seals appointed of God for this end, that by the use thereof, he may the more fully declare and seal to us the promise of the gospel. The sacraments are appendices to the promise. The promise is primary. And the sacraments are simply there to seal, to ratify, to confirm to us the truth of the promise, to make it more real to us. Where God, through these visible external signs, is setting the promise before our very eyes. And even in the sacraments, making it applicable to you as an individual. The promise of the gospel stands out there. Anyone who would believe can be saved, but the sacraments are given to you and to you and to you. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so, so therefore the sacraments are signs that seal the promise to you as an individual, provided of course that you receive the promise in faith. It doesn't function apart from the work of the Spirit in bringing the promise to our conscience and to our heart. This is the Calvinistic reformed understanding of how the sacraments work. They're instruments that the Spirit uses to apply to us the things that the sacraments signify. And the word and the spirit go together. The spirit cannot function without the word, and the word cannot function without the spirit. Okay, so that's sort of an introductory uh, discussion of the sacraments in general. Let's now look to these two big questions. First, the covenantal argument for pedo baptism, and then secondly, the covenantal argument against pedo communion. So, first, the argument for pedo baptism. The argument for pedo baptism has sometimes been um, made in a simplistic way, uh, which is not completely wrong, but it's just lacking in some fuller covenantal context. And the simplistic way is to say, well, in the Old Testament, uh, God told Abraham to, baptize or to circumcise his sons on the eighth day. And in the New Testament, baptism is the replacement for circumcision. Therefore, we should baptize our children in the New Covenant. And that's not a wrong argument. There's certainly truth to it. But it's lacking in some context. It's lacking in some covenantal contours that really make it clearer. So I, I would like to present to you a more full argument for pedo baptism in five steps. First, there is one covenant of grace under two administrations. And so this, I'm just going to say, see lecture, <laughs> what was it, three or four, I can't remember now, where we talked all about the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace 
In, it's initiated in Genesis 3.15, the first promise of the gospel concerning the offspring to come. It's then uh, full, more fully explained and ratified when God makes his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15. And then it's fulfilled in the new covenant. And so we can draw these direct lines. We can link from the, uh, the pre-Abrahamic promise to the pre-Abrahamic fathers such as Abraham, sorry, such as Noah and all those that lived before Abraham. You can draw a line from there to the Abrahamic covenant and from there to the new covenant. The new covenant is not a fundamentally different covenant than the Abrahamic covenant. It's simply the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. And of course, we have this big long discussion there on, well, wait a minute, doesn't, isn't the Abrahamic covenant really about the land promise? Well, we saw that that's not really what it's about. It's about this promise of heaven, which is in, inherited by God's people, the sons of Abraham. And we looked at how Paul in Romans 4 appeals to the Abrahamic promise as ultimately being about salvation in Christ. And the land promise is simply a type and a shadow pointing ahead to the fulfillment in Christ. So the new covenant is not a different covenant from the Abrahamic covenant. It's just simply the fulfilled version of it. And so therefore there is only one covenant of grace. Now there are different administrations of this covenant of grace before and after Christ. The administration of the covenant of grace before Christ has different flavors and context to it and is more emphasizing this earthly land and so on. But even that was a pointer to the reality in Christ. And so the fulfilled administration under Christ is not fundamentally different from the pre-Messianic administration. There is continuity of substance between the, uh, the pre-Messianic administration of the covenant of grace and the fulfilled Messianic administration of the covenant of grace, which we also call the new covenant. There's continuity of substance because it is, there's only one Christ one mediator, one way of salvation, and there's only one people of God. The Apostle Paul makes that so clear in Ephesians 2 through 3. Just read Ephesians 2 and 3, okay? Just sit down, just start from beginning to end, just read those two chapters, and you can't come away from that and say, no, there's actually two different peoples of God. There's an earthly people called Israel, and then there's this totally separate people of God called the church. You can't. You just can't do it. The only way you could do that would be if you just completely overrode what Paul is saying and just said, Paul is wrong <laughs> because Paul makes it so clear. For example, Ephesians 3, 6, he says that we Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow partakers of this one people of God. That God has broken down the dividing wall of hostility and he's brought us together as one new man in Christ. One body. Uh, yes, there are differences between the old covenant administration and the new covenant administration, mainly the typological covenant of works with the blessings and curses in the land. But Paul says in Galatians 3 verses 7 through 19 that the law which was added did not annul the promise that was made to Abraham. And so even though there were these things going on in the old covenant administration that do seem to be at odds with the covenant of grace, blessings and curses, the typological covenant of works related to Israel's ability to stay in the land and all of that, the exile out of the land. Even though there are these things going on that seem at first glance to make it appear that there is no uh, continuity, yet Paul says that e the law was simply an additional temporary measure and it did not annul the Abrahamic promise. That is, it did not annul the underlying covenant of grace. It was added with a particular purpose in order to set the context for Christ to come, to be born under it, and to bear its curse in our place, and to fulfill it so that we could inherit the, the true land, which is not a piece of real estate somewhere in the Middle East, but rather heaven itself. So first, there's one covenant of grace under two administrations. Second stage in the argument for paedo-baptism. The covenant of grace has a visible covenant community. It has these two concentric circles. The outer circle is those who profess faith and their children, 
and the inner circle is among those, those who are the elect. Now we have to recognize, of course, that this inner circle, the election within the bigger circle, that is the whole purpose of this covenant of grace. The purpose of the covenant of grace is to save the elect. But prior to the day of judgment, the covenant of grace contains members who are not elect or regenerate. And Jesus teaches this very clearly in Matthew 13 in the parable of the wheat and the weeds. He even says that at the end, he's going to send his angels to gather out of his kingdom, out of his church. He's going to gather out of his kingdom all that offends, all that is not properly a part of that kingdom. But for the time being, they are a part of that kingdom. That means that we should treat all members of the visible covenant community as believers, even though we're not necessarily 100% sure that they're all elect but we should nevertheless treat them as believers unless they have come under church discipline and been put out of the church as Jesus teaches in Matthew 18. So that's the second stage of the argument. The covenant of grace has a visible covenant community and these two concentric circles. Third, the third step of the argument is that the terms of membership in this outer circle the terms of membership are essentially the same in both administrations of the covenant of grace. That is, the administration before Christ, referring to what we sometimes call the old covenant, and the administration after Christ, which we call the new covenant. Of course, we're not asking here, what are the terms of being elect? What are the terms of being uh, the true people of God? We're just asking, what are the terms of membership within this visible administration, the outer circle? Who should we treat as God's people? The answer is the terms of membership in the covenant community are that you must profess faith in God and God's promises or be under the parental authority of someone who does profess faith. And we see that in both the Old and the New Covenant. So in the, in the Old Testament, for example, someone who professed faith and came into the covenant community from outside would be somebody like Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. She's not a part of the people of God. She wasn't raised in the covenant community, but she professed faith. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God, uh, speaking to her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she became a part of the people of God and was even married to an Israelite. The other way you can be a member of the covenant community is to be under the parental or household authority of someone who does profess faith. And we see this in both the Old and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we see this in Genesis 17, where God says to Abraham that his covenant is made with his children as well. So Genesis 17, verses 9 and 10, God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Or again in Genesis 18 and verse 19, <clears throat> God says to Abraham, this is the, the part where the, uh, the angels came to... Um, to uh, to tell Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a child, your wife is going to bear a child. Um, also, this is right before the part where uh, they inform Abraham that God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham intercedes to spare them, to spare Lot. But right in this context, uh, it says that the angels were, were sitting there, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. And then in verse 19, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So there's this idea of a household and Abraham having authority over his household and being obligated to 
include his household within this covenant community and to teach them the way of the Lord. Same thing in the New Testament, Acts 2.39, the promises for you and for your children. Uh, Acts 11, verse 14, another interesting one. Acts 11, verse 14, this household language is used, just like with Abraham. Uh, this is the story of Cornelius. Um, before Cornelius is, um, this is actually Peter reporting back the story of what happened in chapter 10, but now we're in chapter 11, and Peter says that um, an angel told him, um, told Cornelius, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. That's interesting. You and all your household will be saved? Okay. Sounds a lot like Abraham. Also in Acts 16, verse 31, the Philippine jailer, what must I do to be saved? And then Paul and Silas tell him, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now that's not an absolute guarantee. It's not a guarantee that every single member of your household is gonna be in the inner circle, but this is the ordinary way that God works in order to fulfill his purpose of saving his elect through the covenant nurture of the covenant community. So the third point was that the terms of membership are essentially the same in both administrations of the covenant of grace. Either profess faith yourself as an adult or be under the parental or household authority of someone who professes faith. Fourth, members of the covenant of grace ought to receive the sign of membership in the covenant of grace. This is the part where it's the most um, debated, okay? Members of the covenant of grace ought to receive the sign of membership in the covenant of grace. We agree with that. But the question is, is circumcision in the Old Testament a sign of membership in the covenant of grace. Baptism is clearly a sign of membership in the covenant of grace in the new covenant administration of the covenant of grace, but what about in the Old Testament? I believe that circumcision was indeed the sign of membership in the Abrahamic administration of the covenant of grace. Uh, Paul says that in, in Romans 4.11. It was a sign and seal of the righteousness of faith. It was a sign and seal to Abraham of the gospel, of being justified by faith. Now, many people think that, that, bap, that uh, circumcision was not a sign and seal of the promise of the gospel, but rather was a symbol of being a physical descendant of Abraham. And so they treat baptism, or circumcision, I keep saying that, they treat circumcision in a very earthly way as simply a symbol that you are a physical descendant of Abraham. But that's simply not the case. It's very clear that it's not the case from a number of things. Number one, uh, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 48, Exodus 12, verse 48, this is the passage where God commands the Israelites to offer the, the Passover lamb and to prepare for the angel of, of the Lord that's gonna pass through. But it says in that passage, if a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised per person shall eat of it. So clearly, it's possible for a Gentile, for somebody who's not a physical descendant of Abraham, to be circumcised and then to be able to participate in communion. On the other hand, it's also possible for someone to be a physical descendant of Abraham, but to not be circumcised. And if they're not circumcised, they're not allowed to eat of it. So it's clear that Circumcision is a symbol of God's grace, of the covenant of grace. It's not a symbol merely of biological 
descent from Abraham in a literal sense. It's a sign of membership in the covenant. Remember uh, Genesis 17, verse 14? This is a, a verse that we're going to look at again in just a minute as another objection to this paedo-baptist appeal to circumcision. But just point out in Genesis 17, verse 14, it says, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So clearly, this covenant that God is making with Abraham that creates this covenant community is not defined simply by physical descent because it's possible for an uncircumcised male who is a physical descendant of Abraham to be considered a covenant breaker and therefore someone who is to be removed from the people of God, removed from the covenant community. So it's obvious then that circumcision is not simply a symbol of physical descent from Abraham. Being circumcised meant that you were distinguished from the unclean heathens of the world and you are now a member of God's holy people. Uh, for example, we see this all throughout the book of Judges and 1 Samuel. Uh, it talks a lot about the uncircumcised as this term of derision. Uh, for example, Samson, uh, he had this one in Judges 15, he had this one incident where he I think it's the one with the job one. I can't remember which one it is, but you know he has a number of these different incidents where God uses him mightily to destroy some of the Philistines. He has one where God gave him a great deliverance in Judges 15, verse 18. And he says to God, you have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant. And shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? So that's his term for outsiders to the covenant, people who are not part of God's people. These circumcised, these uncircumcised Philistines, they're called the uncircumcised. And you see this language all throughout 1 Samuel as well, uh, when they're fighting the Philistines. You know, there's one story where Jonathan's like, hey, let's go over, I have this idea, there's some Philistine guys over here in this one rock, and let's go up and we're gonna defeat some of the uncircumcised or something. So the uncircumcised, it's a langu it's language for being an outsider, not being a part of the people of God. Isaiah 52, uh, verse 1, uses it in a prophetic context, referring to Israel in the fulfillment, in the time of the restoration of Israel under the new covenant. God prophesies, there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. So there, the uncircumcised and the unclean are almost equivalent terms. The unclean were those that had to be outside of the camp, outside of God's people. And of course, some, sometimes it did happen to circumcise people, but they were able to come back by offering sacrifices and being restored to the covenant community. But for that time when they're unclean and they're outside, it's as if they're almost equivalent to uncircumcised people. They are outside of the covenant community. So baptism then in the new covenant has the same function as a sign of membership in the new covenant, as a sign of membership in the messianic fulfilled administration of the covenant of grace. Baptism is the new circumcision. Uh, you see this, for example, in Galatians, <coughs> in Galatians chapter three. Galatians chapter three, Paul uses baptism as a, reference to membership in the people of God. Galatians 3, 25 to 29, he says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, that is the, the guardianship of the law. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, there again, I have to put that footnote, the preposition into has to be more nuanced as baptized in relation to Christ or in the name of Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Oftentimes people ask <clears throat> those that are you know, not 
in agreement with our view on pedo baptism and they say you only have one verse that says that baptism is the new covenant version of circumcision colossians chapter 2 uh, verses 11 and 12 i think it is well i would say isn't this one here another one this one here in galatians 3 because if you follow the flow of the argument he's saying if you were baptized into Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. So he's tying, and the whole context of Galatians is that he's trying to argue against the Judaizers who are telling the Galatian Christians that they need to be circumcised. Right? And he's saying very clearly here, you don't, because you're already in Christ as signified and sealed to you in baptism. So this is another passage besides the one in Colossians 2 that ties baptism to circumcision and shows that it has that same function as being a sign and seal of membership in the covenant of grace. Uh, in addition to that passage there in Galatians 3, uh, we can also just think about the fact that both baptism and circumcision have the same essential symbolic meaning, which is that they both symbolize the cutting off of the flesh in the cross. And you might say, okay, I see that with circumcision, cutting off of the flesh. Where do we see that with baptism? Well, we see it with baptism in some interesting verses in the Gospels that are easily, easy to ignore because they don't, people don't quote these very often. <laughs> but in Mark 10, 38, Jesus says, Remember the disciples that wanted to sit, one in his right, one in his left. And he says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? He's talking about the cross. He's using this language of baptism to signify it. And it makes sense, right? Because baptism isn't simply the symbolism of being cleansed with cleansing water. It is that but it's all also the symbolism of being drowned in the water, right? Just like Noah's flood was a symbol of baptism, as Peter says in 1 Peter 3 uh, and verse 21. So being baptized symbolizes judgment. It symbolizes being cut off. It symbolizes dying with Christ in his death and being raised with him to a new life. There's another verse as well in Luke chapter 12, verse 50, where uh, Jesus says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. He's looking forward to the cross. He's on the way to the cross, and he's just setting his face like flint towards Jerusalem because he has this date with destiny there in Jerusalem, and that is his baptism, his death and resurrection which is his judgment in which the Lord is going to cut off the flesh in the cross. And that's exactly what, what uh, Paul says in Galatians, sorry, in Colossians uh, chapter two, in that other verse that makes the connection between baptism and circumcision. Colossians two, verse 11, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. By the way, that phrase at the uh, end of verse 11, where it says, uh, by the circumcision of Christ, that's an ambiguous genitive in Greek. The, the word of in Greek can be translated different ways. Uh, it could be the circumcision that Christ himself performs upon us when he regenerates us. But another possibility is that it's the circumcision that Christ himself underwent. He went under the knife at the cross. The circumcision that Christ himself experienced, just like the baptism of Christ in those two verses in Mark and Luke are referring to his judgment at the cross. The wonderful thing about the cross of Christ is not simply that Christ died so that we didn't have to. It's that in union with Christ, we actually did die. That's the great thing about the cross. We have died with Christ, and now we are raised with him 
to walk in newness of life. The, the atonement, the, the work of Christ, isn't simply substitutionary, it's also representative. He died as our representative. He took all of our sins upon himself and he identified us with himself so that he took us to the cross. It's as if you've already gone to hell and now how can you go to hell a second time, right? Your sins have already been paid for. You've already been completely judged in Christ. And this judgment, of course, is a redemptive judgment. It doesn't lead to your damnation, but to your salvation. This idea of redemptive judgment is all over the place in the Bible, right? Noah's flood. It's judgment for those that are out, outside the ark, but for those who are in the ark, that is in Christ, it's a redemptive judgment that saves them. Peter even says that, 1 Peter 3.21, that they were saved through the water. Not in spite of the water or from the water, they were saved by the water. The waters of judgment actually saved them because the waters of judgment flooded the ark and destroyed the ark, as it were, and yet they were safe in the ark and then they were brought out into the, to the land through the resurrection that came after. A couple of objections here. So this fourth point in the argument um, that members of the covenant of grace ought to receive the sign of membership in the covenant of grace, um, that in itself is not too controversial, but then when we start looking at the details and saying circumcision also symbolizes that, uh, this fourth step, it requires a little bit of discussion because it's, uh, in our arguments with our Baptist brothers, uh, and they are brothers in the Lord, but we just have a difference over this one issue. Uh, in our arguments with them, uh, this keeps coming up. Like They don't like the way that we're connecting circumcision to baptism in a positive way. They want to keep saying, no, we don't want to tie circumcision and baptism too closely together. We want to see circumcision as being something completely different that has to do with either physical descent from Abraham or... Maybe it has to do with some sort of typological republication of the covenant of works, even with Abraham or something like that. Uh, so they're always trying to separate circumcision and baptism, and I'm trying to show, no, they're actually very closely tied. There are a lot of biblical theological um, sinews that connect these two things together in the Bible. So here's another objection that sometimes comes up. Uh, sometimes Baptists will appeal to that verse that I mentioned before in Genesis 17, verse 14, where God threatened uh, Abraham and said, any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. I was using that when I first quoted it as an argument for showing that circumcision is a positive thing that symbolizes membership in the covenant. It doesn't just symbolize um, physical descent from Abraham. But our Baptist brothers will appeal to this verse and say, see, here's another point of discontinuity between circumcision and baptism. Circumcision here seems to be a sign of the covenant of works, not the covenant of grace, because there's this threat. If you're not circumcised, you're going to be cursed. You're going to be cut off. But I think that that reading, the Baptist reading of that verse is um, not quite correct. I think that this language of being cut off is not the being cut off of the curse. It's simply the being cut off from the people. It denotes exclusion from the covenant community. And that's not the same as the curses of the Mosaic covenant. Cursed is the one that does not uh, continue in all the things written in the book of the law to do them. Um, this phrase, to be cut off from the people, is used elsewhere in the Pentateuch in reference to the covenant of grace as it operated within the Mosaic time. Remember, I, this is a very important point, that when we talk about the Mosaic covenant, we have to think of it in both the narrow and the broader aspect, right? In the narrow aspect, the Mosaic covenant is a covenant of works. Do this and you will live. If you don't, you're under a curse. But there's also a broader aspect to the Mosaic Covenant where it is an administration of the covenant of grace. And we see this all over the place in the Pentateuch in the sacrificial system, right? All the sacrifices that were given to Israel, those are sacraments of the covenant of grace for Israel. 
And God was using them to point their faith to the coming Messiah, who would be the final sacrifice, right? But this phrase, if you don't do this, you'll be cut off from the people, uh, it does not denote the curses of the narrow aspect of the Mosaic Covenant. Rather, it denotes and is used in reference to exclusion from the covenant community and the administration of the covenant of grace within the Mosaic time. So, for example, there are many places where you can find this, but in Numbers chapter 9 and verse 13, it says that if anyone fails to observe the Passover, he will be cut off from the people. So clearly we're not going to argue that the Passover is a sign of the covenant of works. No, the Passover is the Passover lamb. It's pointing to Christ. It's, a, it's the sacrament, one of the sacraments of the broader aspect of the Mosaic covenant, the covenant of grace within the Mosaic administration of it. So I think the same thing would apply here then to Genesis 17, 14. Being cut off from the people is um, what happens to anyone who turns away from the covenant. Uh, Sacred Bond puts it this way. They said, anyone who rejected the sign of the covenant was to be cut off from the covenant community. To reject the sign of the covenant was to reject God's promises in the covenant. Ultimately, it was an act of unbelief. Okay, so that's the first objection. Um, Genesis 17, 14, as appealed to by the Baptists. The second objection is, there seems to be a big difference between circumcision and baptism because of the fact that girls were not circumcised. And so the fact that girls were not circumcised seems to raise this question. We know in the New Covenant that um, men and women, boys and girls, are to, be are to be baptized in the New Covenant. But in the Old Covenant, that wasn't the case, so that seems to be another way of trying to break this, this connection between these two signs, between circumcision and baptism. So how would we answer that? Well, I would say this. Do you really want to argue that girls and women in Israel were treated as uncircumcised? Remember that term, the uncircumcised, it was used in Judges and 1 Samuel and Isaiah 52, 1 as a term of referring to outsiders, non-members of the covenant. Are we going to say that they were treated as uncircumcised, as heathens, as outsiders? Clearly they were not. Um, <clears throat> we have language such as this, for example, in 2 Samuel 1, verse 20, uh, there's a reference to the daughters of the uncircumcised. Again, referring to the Philistines, but here they're referred to as the daughters of the uncircumcised, which implies another category, which would be the daughters of the circumcised, right? And the daughters of the circumcised clearly are in a different category. They're in the covenant, right? They're not outsiders. We even have a, another term that's used three times in the Old Testament, the daughters of Israel. Deuteronomy 23, 17, Judges eleven forty, and 2 Samuel 1, 24. Furthermore, we have interesting stories like this one in Genesis 34. Remember Dinah? Everybody thinks about, you know, the sons of Jacob, uh, the 12 sons of Jacob, but they forget that there was also a daughter. Her name was Dinah. And uh, the sons of Jacob were very upset when Dinah was raped by a Canaanite man. And the Canaanite man wanted her to be taken in marriage, wanted to take her in marriage. And the sons of Jacob said that Dinah, their sister, could not be given in marriage to an uncircumcised man. But they said if um, he was circumcised, as well as his whole tribe, that they would allow Dinah to be given in marriage. Of course, they were using it as a ruse because then that whole tribe did do it. They all got the men got circumcised, and then while they were still healing, the sons of Jacob went in there and killed them all. <laughs> so uh, that was pretty bad what they did because it was over the top. It was extreme, and Jacob even said, "You're." You know, you're making me look bad here <laughs> among the Canaanites. But here's the point, though, is that just in, in terms of the basic idea, uh, a daughter of Israel could not be given in marriage to um, 
an uncircumcised man. Another example of this language of um, uh, we're what I'm basically getting at here is this idea that even though girls and women were not circumcised, they were still treated as if they were, right? Another example where you see this is in Judges 14, verse 3. Uh, this is again in the story of Samson, where uh, Samson said he was uh, going down to the Philistines one day and he saw a beautiful Philistine girl and he came back to his, uh, his parents and said, can you go and get her for me, for my wife, to be my wife? And Samson's parents begged him. They said, please don't take a wife from the uncircumcised, from the uncircumcised Philistines. He did it anyway. But you can see that they're concerned about this idea of the, the women who are uncircumcised, or they're, well, obviously they're not uncircumcised, they're not even circumcised, but they're from the uncircumcised group. And so they're viewed as if they are uncircumcised. And then also again in Exodus 12, 48, which I already read, it says no uncircumcised person could eat the Passover and yet women were allowed to eat the Passover. So all of these things then, I'm just making these arguments to say, I think that girls were reckoned as circumcised by being under the authority of their circumcised fathers. So that's my argument then in response to this objection that you can see there's this major difference between circumcision and, uncir and baptism because circumcision wasn't applied to girls. By the way, why was it applied to males? It was applied to males to symbolize the cutting off of the flesh, right? That's what, that's what circumcision symbolizes, the cutting away of the flesh, as Paul says in Colossians 2.11. And so what that shows us then is that the the flesh is not sufficient to inherit the kingdom of God. It's basically saying the same thing that Jesus said. The flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You must be born again. It's symbolizing the need for spiritual regeneration in order to be an heir of God's promises. Okay, so that's, that's a little bit extended discussion under the fourth step of the argument. Let's just go back again, get a running, running uh, momentum here. First, there is one covenant of grace under two administrations. Second, the covenant of grace has a visible covenant community, these two circles. Third, the terms of membership are essentially the same in both administrations of the covenant of grace. Fourth, that's the one we've been spending so much time on, members of the covenant of grace ought to receive the sign of membership in the covenant of grace. Therefore, fifth point, all those who profess faith and their children ought to be baptized in the new covenant. And uh, under that point, we could get into some more details on that, specifically to point out that baptism uh, is administered in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts, but also in 1 Corinthians, not only on the basis of someone making a profession of faith, but it's also administered on the basis of parental authority and those would be the household baptisms in the book of Acts. Acts 10, verse 2, uh, verses 44 to 48, Acts 11, 14, which we already read, Acts 16, verse 15, and verses 33 to 34, Acts 18, 8, and 1 Corinthians 1, 14 to 16. Those are all places where it says, he and his whole household were baptized, or she and her whole household were baptized, referring to Lydia. Interestingly, in the case of Lydia, <coughs> it specifically says that they were baptized on the basis of her profession of faith because she said, if referring to the apostles, if you have judged me to be a believer, then come over to my house. And so she's saying, you've looked at me and determined that I'm a believer. And on the basis of that, you have baptized my whole household. And then also we can point out that the New Testament treats the children of professing believers as members of the church, big circle, as members of the visible covenant community. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, the children are holy. Ephesians 6, 1, in the list of all the different exhortations to masters and slaves and husbands and wives, he also addresses the children as if they're just right there in the congregation. Children obey your parents in the Lord, 
and Colossians 3.20, which is the parallel to Ephesians 6.1. To me, those verses, 1 Corinthians 7.14, Ephesians 6.1, Colossians 3.20, are really important, and they're often overlooked because people are so focused on making the connection between circumcision and baptism that they miss this broader point, which is that everywhere the New Testament addresses the question of how should we view our children? Should we view them as in the church or out of the church? It always says in. They are in the church. Of course, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily elect. Maybe they'll grow up and turn away from Christ, and then they should be put out of the church at that point. But in terms of how we should treat them until that day happens, we should treat them as professing believers. We should treat them as saints. That's the language that Paul even uses for the Church of Corinth, which he knows contains people in it that are not saved, right? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. To those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, to the saints at Corinth, he treats them as believers according to their profession of faith. That's called the judgment of charity. We're not making a determination about someone's elect status. We can't read people's hearts. We don't know who's on the rolls of the elect in heaven. But according to their profession of faith, we give people the judgment of charity and we treat one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And of course, that does include, as Jesus himself taught in Matthew 18, that if your brother sins, you go to him and you address him as a brother and you try to win them. Only if they refuse and harden their heart do you then change the way you treat them to treating them as a tax collector and a Gentile. All right, let us now take a few questions and then we will move on to the issue of pedo communion. First Corinthians 7, verse 14, okay. <clears throat> so this is in the context of Paul's teaching about marriage and divorce. And <clears throat> he says in verse, we'll just back up to verse 10. To the married I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband parentheses, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I, not the Lord. So the, the statement he said before, not I, but the Lord, he's saying that Jesus himself taught this, Matthew 19. But here in verse 12, he's saying the Lord himself didn't teach this. I'm teaching this as an apostle who has inspiration from the Lord, but it's not, it doesn't go back to the words of the historical Jesus. To the rest I say, not the Lord, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. And if any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. So here, Paul uses this language of holy, which I mentioned before is the same root that he used at the beginning of Cor the letter to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, the word sanctified there, is simply the verb form of this adjective holy. So if you wanna see the connection, you could translate the word holy in verse 14 as uh, sanctified. That the unbelieving husband is sanctified because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. They're set apart as sanctified. So. I think that it's clear that this language of sanctification is not being used in the technical sense that we would use it to refer to being savingly united to Christ and having uh, the Spirit dwell within us, but rather being used in this covenantal sense 
that is similar to the language that we were talking about before about the circumcised and the uncircumcised, those who are in the covenant community and those who are out of the covenant community. So the fact that he says there that um, the children would, would be unclean if it weren't true that the unbelieving husband is sanctified because of his wife, the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. That seems to suggest that Paul thinks of the children, again, as members of the covenant community, as set apart from the world, and therefore as holy in that covenantal sense. Joel. Question for, in regards to New Testament pastors, what if they, they were baptized in their houses? <coughs> in the original language that we know throughout the New Testament, is it the same word, and then does that definition of that word, do you know of like other secular old Greek manuscripts that that same word was used and how they used it in that it meant this certain thing and that there was no differentiation between an age group within that house, in those households, like yeah, so <clears throat> when it talks about household baptism in the book of Acts uh, for the question, for the recording, uh, does that word household, does it mean, uh, does it include the children or is there an age differentiation within it? The answer is that the word household doesn't say anything about age. It's just talking about the, the family uh, and it's focused primarily on the children of whatever age. Uh, it could also include servants, but it's primarily focused upon the children of whatever age. And so you can't read into that anything that would say, oh, it's only talking about children if they're over a certain age. Um, the point is, is that it uses that language of uh, he and his whole household, and that language, he and his whole household, is directly taken from the Old Testament. It's used all over the place in the Old Testament. We saw one in uh, Genesis 18, verse 19. Abraham, God says, I have chosen him uh, so that he would uh, direct his household after him. So that language is, it's intentionally used to connect to the Old Testament idea of parental authority. And so therefore it doesn't, um, it doesn't work to say that it's only referring to those that are old enough to hear and understand. Again, going back to that key verse in Acts 16, verse 15, where <coughs> this is the baptism of Lydia and her household, um, it says very explicitly that the baptism occurred because the apostles judged her to be a believer, not because they judged every member of the household to be a believer. So our Baptist brothers will say, okay, when it says that, um, that she was baptized and her household, Acts 16, verse 15, um, we can assume that this, this household is, they would say, is uh, referring to children who were old enough to hear and understand the gospel. Um, but it says in verse 15, after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be a believer in the Lord, come to my house and stay. It sometimes says, the ESV says faithful, but that just means believer. So clearly the baptism was administered to the household on the basis of her profession of faith, not on the basis of the profession of faith of all the members of the household. Any other questions about pedo baptism? And then just to real quick um, clarify, just one more ask, Pastor. Correct me if I'm wrong. <coughs> where it says, where it talks about this first sentence. Household would be that well they heard the gospel too they responded mm -hmm. they were also baptized here it's just talking about her hearing the gospel right 
Right. Or their response to hearing the gospel. It doesn't say anything about the household's response to the gospel. There are other cases, though, where it does. So, for example, um, <clears throat> in the, the case of the Philippian jailer, which is just a few paragraphs down in that same chapter, um, it says, Acts 16, verse 31, after he said, what was I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. So there it does mention that the people in the house, who are w of whatever age, that they also heard. Um, and so you could say, well, maybe in that case, also the fact that in verse 34 at the end it says, he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. That, that one's kind of ambiguous because it clearly says that he had believed in God, but it does mention that he rejoiced along with his entire household. So there you could say, okay, well maybe they're old enough to rejoice. But the point is, is that uh, it doesn't mention the response of the household in the case of Lydia. It does mention that in the case of the Philippian jailer, but even in the Philippian jailer, it focuses on his faith that he had come to believe in God, and also it uses this same formula, this formula, it's called the household formula, that he and his whole household believed, or he and his whole household, you will be saved, you and your whole household. So that language of you and your household, that's clearly Old Testament language. We see that with Noah, we see that with Abraham, we see that all over the place in the Old Testament. Uh, and so the fact that it's using that Old Testament covenantal language shows us that the baptism is being performed as a household baptism on the basis of the faith of the head of the household. So. Okay, let's move on then to <coughs> the argument against pedo communion. So historically, the Reformed tradition has argued that there are three verses in 1 Corinthians 11 that seem to require a profession of faith as a precondition for participating in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Paul says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so, that is because you've examined yourself. And so in this way, in a self-examination way, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29. In those verses, Paul seems to imply that you must be able to examine yourself to partake of the Lord's Supper and that if you don't examine yourself and you don't discern the significance of the body, which is ambiguous, does that mean the body in terms of the body of Christ or does that mean the body in terms of the meaning of the bread symbolizing the body? Uh, I think it's probably both, but the focus seems to be on the bread. Because Paul says self-examination is necessary and in this way, when you do eat in this manner, you are partaking in a worthy manner, and if you don't, you're partaking in an unworthy manner, and then you are eating and drinking judgment on yourself. Because of this passage, the Reformed tradition has uh, traditionally argued that, uh, ba that communion is different from, the, from baptism, that baptism uh, does not require conscious faith and profession of faith, but um, at least for the children, but uh, the Lord's Supper does. So for example, Heidelberg Catechism 81, who should come to the Lord's table? Answer, those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their remaining weakness is covered by the suffering and death of Christ, and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. So, you know, a one-year-old or a six-month-old baby would not be able to do this, to be displeased with their, themselves because of their sins and trusting in Christ and desiring to lead a better life. Westminster Ca uh, Larger Catechism, question 97, similarly says, what is required to the worthy receiving of the Lord's Supper? It is required of them that would worthily partake 
of the Lord's Supper, that they examine themselves of their knowledge to discern the Lord's body, of their faith to feed upon him, of their repentance, love, and new obedience, lest, coming unworthily, they eat and drink judgment to themselves. So these uh, statements from the Reformed Confessions uh, show that the Reformed tradition has been pretty uniform in requiring a profession of faith as a precondition to partaking. In other words, uh, credo communion, <laughs> if we would use a parallel to credo baptism, our Baptist brothers who hold to credo baptism say you have to have a profession of faith before you can be baptized. Um, we say no because of the household baptisms and because of the uh, covenantal argument that we just went through. Um, but the Reformed tradition flips it and goes, not when it comes to communion. So are we inconsistent? We say that there's this strong parallel between circumcision and baptism. We've tied all those threads together and showed how tightly connected those two rites or rituals are. Um, and we've used that to make the argument for pedo baptism just like there was pedo circumcision in the Old Testament. Uh, but are we inconsistent? Because we could make a similar argument, couldn't we, from Passover to the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper was clearly administered on the night in which Jesus was betrayed during the same time as the Passover of Israel. And in fact, in that moment when they're preparing to, for example, in Mark, Gospel of Mark chapter uh, 14, verse 12, as they're preparing for the Lord's Supper, they tie it to Passover. Mark 14, 12, on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And then he says, you know, you'll go into the city, you'll find a man who says, you know, there's a guest room and all that. So it's clear that the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, um, occurred at the same time as the Passover and is in fact a Passover meal. And yet, according to the Old Testament, Passover was not given only to the adults who had a profession of faith. It seems as though Passover was uh, something that was permitted for the entire family to partake of. For example, in Exodus 12, verse 4, uh, this is the first Passover. Um, God said to Israel that they are to uh, find a lamb or however many lambs they need according to what each can eat, according to every mouth in the household, literally. That's how you count the size of the lamb or if you need more than one uh, for that household or if you're a smaller household and you're sharing with your neighbor, you can pick the lamb based upon the number of mouths in the household. So it seems to imply that uh, Passover was a household affair and not only for those who made a profession of faith. So are we inconsistent then to make this biblical theological argument from circumcision to baptism to argue for pedo baptism, but then when we come to the Lord's Supper, we flip it and say, no, 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 it doesn't apply there. So at first it may seem like we're inconsistent, but uh, I think that we can use some biblical, theological, and covenantal reasoning to see our way through this dilemma. Uh, first of all, I would just say, just as a simple point before we even get into these arguments, is just that you still have to deal with 1 Corinthians 11, right? Because 1 Corinthians 11 is so clear, and that's why the uh, Reformed tradition has just followed that text and said, look, it says you have to examine yourself. So because of that, um, that we, if, if we didn't have that verse, we might then be inclined to say, well, you know, the Passover argument suggests that the Lord's Supper should also be given to children, pedo communion. But because we have that verse in 1 Corinthians 11, or that actually paragraph, um, verses 27 to 29, which is so strong and it's so heavy too, because it says if you don't, eat in a worthy manner, then you're going to eat and drink judgment on yourself, right? So it's pretty heavy, serious stuff. But if we were to 
s sort of set that aside for a moment and say, how can we deal with this other argument of Passover and the Lord's Supper uh, from a biblical, theological, and covenantal way? How can we respond to that? So my first argument would be that the first thing we have to notice is that um, what, what is it that is, what does the Lord's Supper symbolize? What is the outward sign in the Lord's Supper? Uh, with baptism and even with circumcision, the outward sign is tied to this idea of a one-time event that separates you from the world and puts you into the visible church. But in the Lord's Supper, there's something else going on there. In the Lord's Supper, the outward sign is eating bread and drinking wine. And the very fact that we have a sacrament that is focused upon eating and drinking uh, seems to point in the direction of conscious faith. Because what does the eating and drinking of the literal bread and the drinking of the literal wine symbolize? It symbolizes the spiritual feeding of our souls upon Christ. We're being nourished by his body and we are drinking his blood in a spiritual sense. We're not literally chomping on Christ's body and literally drinking the hemoglobin of Christ's blood, but we are spiritually feeding upon Christ's sacrifice. Uh, for example, the Belgian Confession, question, uh, paragraph or article 35, says, just as truly as we take and hold the sacraments in our hands and eat and drink it in our mouths, by which our life is then sustained, so truly we receive into our souls for our spiritual life the true body and true blood of Christ, our only Savior. We receive these by faith, which is the hand and mouth of our souls. I love that way of describing uh, faith as the hand and mouth of our souls. So the very, just looking at the symbolism itself, this is my first argument before we get to talk about Passover in more detail. Just look at what the Lord's Supper itself um, symbolizes. The outward sign is eating and drinking and that signifies an inner spiritual feeding upon Christ and being nourished by him, and how do we feed upon Christ? What does it mean to eat Christ? What does it mean to drink Christ's blood? It means to exercise faith, right? So you have conscious faith in Christ. Uh, Jesus makes that point in John 6, that whole uh, long uh, treatment of the, where he says, I'm the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and died, but I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And of course, there's a whole debate about whether that passage is even alluding to the Lord's Supper it doesn't really matter for our purposes at this point whether it is or isn't. Uh, just the clear statement there in that whole section in John 6, if you just read it, is that Jesus is using eating and drinking as a metaphor for believing in him. Whoever believes in me has life. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood by faith has eternal life. But this is different from baptism because baptism is like circumcision. It's to be administered only once as a sign of membership in the covenant of grace. Whereas the Lord's Supper is to be enjoyed many times for our spiritual nourishment as we, through the sacrament, have our faith strengthened and uh, developed so that we are actively partaking of Christ. In fact, that's why the Lord's Supper is also called communion, right? It's called communion. That comes from Paul's language in, Rome, in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. Uh, the cup which we bless, is it not a communion in the body of uh, the blood of Christ, and so on. It's called communion because we're having communion, we're having fellowship with Christ by faith. And so you can see just by looking at the sign itself and what the sign symbolizes, that there's a big difference between the Lord's Supper and baptism. Baptism is a sign of membership in the covenant of grace. You're not an unbaptized, uncircumcised heathen. You're not unclean. You are now separated from the world and you're brought into the covenant community. Whereas the Lord's Supper symbolizes and signifies active 
faith in Christ, communing with Christ by conscious faith. And so therefore, necessarily, you can't partake in, in the proper manner. And when Paul says in a worthy manner, he doesn't mean that you're worthy because of your merit or because of your obedience. He just simply means in a matter, manner that is appropriate to the sacrament, in a manner that is fitting given the nature of the sacrament. You can't partake in the sacrament in a worthy or fitting way unless you're partaking with faith with conscious faith in Christ. Remember the Corinthians, the whole context there in 1 Corinthians 11, the Corinthians were treating the Lord's Supper as an ordinary meal. And they were using it as an opportunity to get full and to get drunk, right? And they were having this meal that was just like, like a, we would call it a, you know, a, lunch, a fellowship luncheon, <laughs> right? Um, but that's not how Paul wants them to do it. He says, don't treat the Lord's Supper as if it's just an ordinary meal. Treat it as a special holy sacrament where you are communing with Christ, discerning the Lord's body, that is discerning the significance of the sacrament as participating in Christ and his sacrifice. Okay, so that's my first argument uh, against Pado communion is to see the difference between baptism and the Lord's Supper because of what the Lord's Supper symbolizes. Secondly, the second argument is where we're going to get into this issue of the Passover. So my second argument is that I don't think that the Lord's Supper is simply, in a simplistic way, simply a new covenant version of the Passover. I think it clearly includes that, but it's more than that. It's actually something broader that ties back to the five sacrifices that are described in the book of Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus chapters one through seven, the opening seven chapters of the book of Leviticus provide instruction to the Israelites on uh, five sacrifices that they were to offer. The sin offering, the guilt offering, the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the peace offering. And that fifth one, the peace offering, is the closest one to the Lord's Supper because it is called a peace offering, which is actually very closely related to this concept of communion. It's a fellowship offering. And actually, we can simplify the five sacrifices uh, into three because the sin offering and the, and the guilt offering are essentially the same in the sense that they both deal with sin, right? And the burnt offering and the grain offering are essentially the same because both of them involve taking the sacrifice and completely burning it up so that it turns into smoke to ascend into heaven. So really you have the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering. You have three major sacrifices. The peace offering was unique because it was the only one of the five from which the offerer could eat. And all the other sacrifices Either it's totally burnt up to God and goes into smoke uh, into heaven where it becomes a soothing aroma for God, or the priests in the sin offering and the guilt offering, they could partake of some of the meat of the sacrificial offering, but the offerer himself could not. It was off limits for a lay person. The peace offering is the only one where the lay person, the offerer, who's bringing the sacrifice, could also eat. The other four sacrifices were to be given to God alone or to his representative, the priest. The peace offering thus symbolized the resultant fellowship that was enjoyed between God and his people once atonement had been made. The other four sacrifices, and we could actually combine them into two, uh, the sin offering and the burnt offering, those two uh, sacrifices are the offerings that atone for sin. The peace offering or the fellowship offering symbolizes the resultant fellowship that is enjoyed between God and his people once atonement has been made. The peace offering was divided into two portions, the portion given to God and the portion given to the offerer. The portion given to God was always the fat. The fat of the sacrifice was the best part. That was the portion that was given to God. Like the blood, the fat was holy, and thus it could not be eaten by man. 
The fat portion was placed upon the altar of burnt offering and turned into smoke as a sweet aroma for God to enjoy. But then the re remaining portion of the sacrifice was eaten by the offerer. Eating a meal had a sacred significance in the ancient world. Table fellowship symbolized the absence of hostility. And so the peace offering signified reconciliation with God. It was a sacred covenant bond, a bond of union and communion between God and his redeemed people. Interestingly, the peace offering was also the sacrifice that could be used whenever an Israelite wanted to make a free will offering, such as to fulfill a vow or to give thanks to God for a special deliverance. Let's say the offerer had gotten terribly sick and felt like he was at death's door, but then God healed him, and now he wants to thank the Lord. So he could bring a peace offering to the tabernacle or the temple to the Lord. So these five sacrifices, which can be uh, simplified to three, they form a coherent systematic theology of atonement. And it's very interesting, in Leviticus 9, verse 22, it says that Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. This is right after the ordination of Aaron and his sons in Leviticus chapter 8 and 9. So you have the, seven, you have the five sacrifices in chapters 1 through 7. Then you have the ordination of Aaron and his sons in chapter 8 and 9. And at the end of the ordination, it says, Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he stepped down after making the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings. It only mentions three. So it's supporting my argument that you can combine the, the grain offering into the burnt offering and you can combine the guilt offering into the sin offering. And also notice the order. The order is the sin offering first, then the burnt offering, then the peace offerings. Why? Because sin has to be dealt with first before you can have reconciliation and communion with God. And notice how the atonement, the idea of atoning for sin has both aspects to it, both the sin offering aspect and the burnt offering aspect, which points to the active and passive obedience of Christ, right? The passive obedience of Christ is where he's bearing the curse of the law in our place. That's the sin offering. And the uh, active obedience of Christ is his perfect obedience to God, which is sim sim uh, symbolized in the burnt offering, where the entire offering is turned into smoke. A technical term for it is sublimation. It goes directly from a solid state to a gas state called sublimation. That symbolizes the active obedience of Christ as Paul says in Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, that Christ loved us and gave himself up as a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God. So the sin offering and the burnt offering together are what atone for sin. Both the active and the passive obedience are what atone for sin. The fellowship offering, or the peace offering, is the resultant reality that now we have fellowship with God and that's why it's the one sacrifice that the offer can also eat. The Passover was an annual sacrifice. The Passover was clearly, if you had to define it as which of these five is it, it's clearly a peace offering, right? Because we know that because people ate the Passover, right? So clearly it's a peace offering. It's one of the examples of a peace offering. There are different types or different instances of peace offerings. There's peace offerings, for example, as I said before, that are voluntary, free will offerings, and so on. But the Passover then is one subcategory under this broader category of the peace offering. So what I'm saying then, my argument is, that the Lord's Supper should not be viewed as nothing but the Passover, but rather it should be viewed as the culmination of the peace offering, which itself is the culmination of the entire sacrificial system. And so that's why it's important to not only look at the initial Passover that was offered in Exodus 12, when they're about to cross over the Red Sea, but also to look at the other Passovers as they began to evolve once they went into the land and built the temple. Remember in the Gospels, 
that you see by the time you get to the time of Jesus and the New Testament, the way that they offered this, the Passover was not just like with the first Passover in Exodus 12, each Jew in their own family, or each Jewish family just having their own Passover lamb in their own house, but rather you had to go to Jerusalem. That's why there was these tremendous crowds uh, at the time of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion because all of the Jews from around the world were going to Jerusalem to observe this Passover sacrifice, this, this Passover festival, which was in the context of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You couldn't, even, you couldn't even bring a Passover lamb to your own house and sacrifice it there and have a Passover meal. You had to go to the temple. That's why the money changes were in the temple, because you had to go and buy a lamb, right? And then take it to the priest and have him sacrifice it. And then you could take it home and have the Passover with your family. The Passover lamb was sacrificed in the temple. And although children were not excluded from the first Passover, neither were they commanded to do it afterward when they got into the land. In fact, when they got into the land, the Bible says only the adult males are commanded to go up to the temple three times a year for the three annual festivals, one of which was Passover. And remember as well that if the Passover is a peace offering, remember that the peace offering had to be taken to the, to the priest to, for the priest to sacrifice it. The offer himself couldn't do the, the actual act of sacrificing the animal, that is pulling the neck back, getting a knife, and then slaughtering it. The priest had to do that. And before that happened, what did the ritual say to do? So look at Leviticus chapter 3. Leviticus chapter 3 explains the ritual. It's verses 1 and 2. This is the chapter on the peace offering. If his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons and the priests shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar. But notice this ritual of laying your hand upon the offering. This to me is what ties into the Lord's Supper. And that's why Paul has this view of the Lord's Supper as being a conscious act of faith where you are aware of your sin and you are trusting in Christ for forgiveness. And you are seeking to live as becomes a follower of Christ. You have a repentant heart that you are seeking to place yourself in identifying with the sacrifice. Uh, notice how Paul argues. So the, the conclusion we, which we read in verses 27 to 29, make sure you partake in a worthy manner, that conclusion is based on an argument. The argument is that he quotes the words of the institution. What did our Lord Jesus say? He said, do this in remembrance of me. Paul quotes that twice for both the cup and the bread. Do this in remembrance of me. For Paul, this means more than simply remembering that Christ died. It means something more. It means laying your head upon the, on the head of, laying your hand upon the head of Christ. It means that you are actively appropriating his death and participating in it. You're proclaiming his death, he says, right? Paul says, when you say this, when you partake of the Lord's Supper, you are proclaiming his death until he comes. Otherwise, if you don't do that, if you're not coming to the Lord's Supper with this conscious faith of actively appropriating his death and your participation in it, then you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So I think this is, this is the best argument then, is to, um, to show that there is a difference between the Passover and the Lord's Supper, even though the Lord's Supper clearly was instituted at the same time as the Passover, it's not simply the same thing as the Passover. It is uh, also bringing in this whole theology of sacrifice and especially the peace offering from Leviticus chapter three, verse two. He shall lay his head on the head, he shall lay his hand on the head of the offering. One thing to notice as well that ties into this is in 1 Corinthians 10 <clears throat> and verses uh, 
uh, 14 to 22. Notice how Paul speaks about the Lord's Supper. He says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. So he's talking about the Lord's Supper, but he's also talking about idolatry at the same time. He doesn't want the Corinthians to be engaged in idolatry, specifically by going to a pagan temple and participating in a meal ritual in the pagan temple in honor of the God. He says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? That's a key verse right there. What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So what's so interesting here is that Paul here is viewing the Lord's Supper as being similar to the sacrificial system of Israel and clearly as more than just the Passover because he talks about are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar. There was no altar in the first Passover in Exodus 12. They hadn't yet come into the land. So this idea here of eating the sacrifices symbolizes partaking in the altar goes back to this idea again that you are identifying with the work of Christ with his death for your sins. You are doing this in remembrance of Christ and his death. You're proclaiming Christ's death by an act of conscious faith. And therefore, it requires a profession of faith in order to do that in a fitting manner that is uh, consistent with the meaning of the sacrament. Okay, so I think that's good enough. Those are the two main arguments against paedo-baptism. Just looking at what, this, what the sacrament symbolizes, active faith and nourishment as we feed upon Christ. And then secondly, looking at this theology of sacrifice, in particular broadening it out from the Passover and even from the first Passover to the subsequent Passovers uh, in the land when they went to the temple and then seeing how Christ fulfills that. All right, any questions about the argument against Pado communion? Yes. Some churches do, yes. Uh, there is a group of churches that are associated with Doug Wilson called the uh, Communion of Reformed Evangelicals, Communion of Reformed Evangelical Churches that do practice that, yeah. I don't know if all of the churches in that denomination do it, but Many of them do, yeah. I was just told actually this week that some, someone I know is PCA practices it. Do you know anything about PCA starting to allow that within their churches? I have not heard that. Uh, the PCA ha has historically not permitted that. Mm -hmm. um, so if there are individual churches that are doing that, then that would be a matter for the presbytery to look into and try to uh, deal with. But in the PCA Book of Church Order, it's very explicit <coughs> that, um, that children may participate in the Lord's Supper, but only if they have made a public profession of faith that's been approved by the elders. Yeah. So that's an important point to bring up too, which is we're not saying that children cannot partake, but and we're not giving a specific cutoff and saying, you know, has to be over the age of 12 or something. But if, if a child does want to partake, they have to make a profession of faith that has been examined by the elders. Yeah. So that could be the situation. Maybe it's a case not of technical paedo communion, but 
of just allowing younger children and that that particular church would say, yeah, but we, we actually examined them and they, they made a profession of faith. But maybe some of the other churches in that neighborhood are kind of looking with raised eyebrows like, I don't know, six years old, are, are you sure? <laughs> maybe they're having some debates over the age. But that's not really the issue. The issue is not the age. The issue is uh, requiring a profession of faith. Yeah. So what was the practice of the early church on this question? Uh, <clears throat> that whole question is a complete can of worms, and it's the same for paedo-baptism. So on the issue <clears throat> that comes up with these debates is it'd be helpful to get some insight from the early church, and you can find arguments from both sides for both positions, for both sacraments. So um, in, in my opinion, the uh, evidence for paedo-communion in the early church it does exist, but it's not super early. Uh, there, there's some debate about one particular early church father, I think it was Cyprian, if I recall, where there's a passage that could be possibly taken in a way that supports Pato communion. That would be pretty early, I think he was third century. But in my opinion, the earliest clear evidence for it is Augustine, but that's like late fifth or late fourth, early fifth century. Augustine was very clear. Augustine totally believed in Pato communion <laughs> and he's very explicit about it and repeatedly, like many passages in Augustine where he says it. So for that reason, I would say, because Augustine was on the side of Pato communion, I would say that uh, it's not heretical to practice that um, and we shouldn't view it as some like heretical thing that, that some people practice that. But it is also just very scary because of that warning passage in 1 Corinthians 11 where, okay, well, if you are practicing this, then what are you doing? What steps are you taking to make sure that people don't eat and drink judgment to themselves, you know? So that would be my concern with it. That's why I'm concerned about paedo communion because of the warning. But I wouldn't say that it's a heretical view because Augustine did teach it. Yeah. Go ahead. Going back to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 18, when it talks about uh, the people eat, people of Israel, those who eat the sacrifice uh, uh, apart from the camp of the altar. Can you touch again on that? What does that cover? Okay, so what I'm getting at there <coughs> in, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 18 is that this, couple things. One thing is that this verse here clearly supports my contention that uh, the New Testament does not view the Lord's Supper as simply being a repetition of the first Passover in Exodus 12, uh, as being just a continuation of the first Passover in Exodus 12. Because the first Passover in Exodus 12, there was no altar. It was a household affair. You didn't have to go to Jerusalem and offer the sacrifice at the altar. Um, but here it's clear that Paul is thinking about the, the way in which the Passover, which itself is part of this broader category called the peace offering, is conducted at the altar. And he's using that as an argument for why you can't go to the Lord's table, the altar of the Lord, and then turn right around on Monday and go to a pagan altar and participate with demons. So that's the first point, is that it's clear that there's more to the Lord's Supper than just the first Passover. The second thing, though, is that it also ties in with this idea that I'm trying to make of that the peace offering and the Lord's Supper being viewed as a peace offering is an act of conscious faith. It's like the free will offering where this person who has a profession of faith, not just a covenant child, is coming to the Lord and putting their hand upon the head of the sacrifice and identifying with the sacrifice. And so that, that ties in with Paul's argument 
not only here in chapter 10, but then in the next chapter, chapter 11, that uh, you must discern the Lord's body and active, have active faith, conscious, active, informed faith, where you have some knowledge of Christ and your sinfulness and so on in order to partake in an appropriate manner. He's referring to Leviticus 3, the passage that I was talking about where the offerer actually participates in the sacrifice and eats of it. Yeah. And shifts from being your discernment of the heavens, taking an unworthy manner. Wouldn't you take the context in the sense of from verse 17 to verse uh, uh, 19 and 20, where they were getting drunk and uh, they had some people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly what I was saying. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> when he says in an unworthy manner, he's not saying the way we think of that I'm worthy because of my obedience. He's talking about partaking in a manner that is appropriate to the nature of this meal as a sacrament, as opposed to the way the Corinthians were doing it, which was they were treating it like an ordinary meal. And so <clears throat> that's why I take, I think, this is debated, and I'm not 100% sure, but that's why I take the phrase discerning the Lord's body to mean discerning the sacramental significance of the bread and the, and the cup, as opposed to the alternative view, which is that it means discerning the corporate nature of the body of Christ as we partake. And the reason why that's important is because those who hold the Pado communion will like that second view better, because then you don't have to worry about this idea of having knowledge of what the sacrament means, and then it becomes more of a communal thing. And then they would even turn this passage against us and say, you're not discerning the Lord's body because you're excluding some members of Christ's body from the table. So... You know, that's a really good question. What was, it, what was really going on there <laughs> with the Corinthians? You know how it mentions uh, this idea of the agape meal? Uh, that seems to be pretty similar to what we would call, you know, our fellowship luncheon or potluck, you know, where Christians are getting together and enjoying an ordinary meal together as just a symbol of our unity as Christians. But it seems like what was going on in Corinth was that they had conflated the agape meal with the Lord's Supper and were combining them into one thing and were therefore disregarding the special significance of the Lord's Supper as a sacrament. Yeah. I don't have all the arg arguments and evidence in front of me okay. in my notes, but the question for the recording is, could I get into the historical arguments over the early church on Pado baptism um, there, There's a number of different types of evidence for it. So, um, you know, there are, there are passages that are explicitly addressing the question, and then there are also passages in the church fathers, apostolic fathers, where they say something that seems to imply that a child had been baptized at a very young age. 
And so there's, there's mo more than one type of evidence that we're looking at. And so it becomes debated, like, how do you interpret those ones that are more implied? Like, you could take them as suggesting that a child was baptized as a Christian at a very young age, or you could find some other way to interpret those passages. Uh, I think the famous one is, was it Polycarp who said that he had served Christ for 86 years? So that seems to imply that he's about 86 at that point when he's saying that, he's about to be martyred or something, and he's looking back to his childhood, his infancy, and implying that he was a Christian from infancy, which seems to suggest that he was baptized as an infant. But it doesn't prove it, it's just an implication, you know? So there are a lot of passages like that in the Church Fathers that you could, where we can wrangle on both sides. The Baptists and the Pado baptists can wrangle over them and say, well, you could interpret it this way or you could interpret it that way. The clearest uh, passages where it's directly and explicitly taught uh, in my opinion, would be, uh, if I can remember the name of it, I don't have any of this information in front of me, so I'm just speaking off the top of my head. I think it's a document called the Apostolic Constitutions, written by a church father named Hippolytus, who dates to around the third century, like mid to late 200s, maybe early 300s. No, mid to late 200s, I think. And... He was a bishop in Rome, and he wrote a document that is kind of like a church order explaining how worship should be conducted, and he talks about explicitly that, you know, baptism should be done by families, and the children should be baptized as well. But that's, you know, late 200s, so that's, it's not super early, whereas Polycarp is super early. That's like, you know, early, one, you know, early 100s, early 2nd century. So that's where you have these wrangles and back and forth, dating, questions of dating, questions of how to interpret, but it's really hard to get around that one that I was just quoting from, the Apostolic Constitutions. That one I think is pretty explicit. Um, but then there's other arguments too that would say even later on, it gets really complicated because later on, you start to have a tendency in the uh, early church, by this time it's not really early church, it's more like, um, the third, fourth century. So we're talking already almost 300 years after the apostolic age. So it's not super early, but it's still sometimes called the early church. In that time frame, you start to see people delaying baptism, where they don't want to get baptized as early as possible because they're afraid that they might sin and they want to have this final act of baptism like soon before they die to like deal with all their sins. And you start to see this theology of baptism begin to arise that baptism actually forgives you, causes the forgiveness of sins, right? So it's tied into that. Um, but then at the same time, right at that same time, you have Augustine who's appealing to baptism in his argument against Pelagius. Pelagius is denying original sin and saying that uh, everyone is born innocent but then we can individually choose to follow Adam's bad example. And Augustine says, no, we're born sinners. Otherwise, why would we baptize infants? So it's a complicated scenario where you can find evidence from different sides to support different positions. Uh, and uh, I don't have all of the arguments to back up to give like a clear, decisive explanation of everything, but it's a complicated subject, so. Thanks for asking. All right. Were there any online? No? Okay. All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the study that you allowed us to have to study covenant theology, all of the ins and outs of it, and to see how everything uh, reminds us of your amazing covenant faithfulness that you have uh, shown to us in sending your son to establish the new covenant in his blood. And we thank you that because of this covenant, we are uh, reconciled to you, that we have uh, this wonderful reality of the law written upon our hearts.
and that we are part of your people, the people of God. Thank you for giving us these signs and seals of the covenant to confirm to us the truth of the promise and to assure us that we belong to you. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. 